I'm Joe Pierce, and this is the third Inherit the Earth Sand and Shadows Developers Report. This time around, we'll start with our usual status report, followed by a report on GameX, a con I attended over Memorial Day weekend, then an interview with Walt Hochbruckner, and finally a second con report, this time Califer, that was held early in June. Last time I mentioned that Ed Lachaban was working on the interior of the Temple of the Orb. Here's the concept sketch I showed last time, and here's the finished background. The next background being worked on is from a scene inside the Ferret Village. To be exact, it's the exterior shot of this interior shot that has already been completed. Falconese has started working on the walking animations for Riff. At this time, all I have are some concept sketches for that, but hopefully we'll have something more concrete next time. Finally, I've been working on some additional features in the game engine. First of all, we have the conversation system. This is where the player is given a set of choices of what to say or ask of other characters in the scene. It is now also possible to create non-rectangular areas of importance in the scene. In this case, we see originally I had a rectangular area for where Riff could walk and turned it into a polygonal one by actually editing the vertexes I've also done some work on voiceovers and sound effects. I can't complete the voiceover work until I have talking animations to test against. On the Saturday, Memorial Day weekend, I attended GameX, one in a series of conventions held under the Strategicon banner and held at the LA Airport Hilton. There were a wide range of games being run in the various rooms at the Hilton, including board games, miniature games, including the well-known Warhammer, collectible card games, electronic gaming, plus some room for open gaming where anyone could set up and run their own game. This included a group showing off a war game with the largest board that I've seen in quite a while, based upon World War I, called The Great War. Attendees could actually check out a game to play from the library at the convention, or they could just go to the dealer's room and purchase a game that they might be interested in playing. The variety of games available in the dealer's room was quite wide. Because of my schedule over that weekend, I was unable to attend more than part of one day at this convention. One of the reasons was that later that Saturday, I traveled to the San Fernando Valley to interview a friend of mine. This month's interview is with Walt Hochbruckner. Thanks for joining me, Walt. Oh, you're welcome. Good to see you. Uh, tell the listeners a little bit about yourself. Well, I was a computer game programmer for about 23 years. I originally called myself a game architect because I did everything except artwork. I did the typical programmer's art, which was manifestly defunct in many ways, but it served its purpose very well. Um, then after that, I retired and got into acting and now directing. We'll discuss some of your non-gaming activities later in the interview, but let's start with your first job in the gaming industry. My first job in the gaming industry was with a company called Datamost in Chatsworth, California. I had written a game on my own time when I was living up in Seattle called Conquering Worlds. They decided that they were going to publish the game. They liked it a lot. They liked me a lot. They liked how I was able to do so many things because I was very versatile in terms of uh, protection, uh, strategies, and uh, heuristics, that they hired me in, into their company. I did most of their projects uh, and did that for a period of about, oh, uh, it was about three years or so. After Datamost, you did some projects for a company called Microillusions, which also published some titles produced by Talon. That's correct. I worked on Sky Travel, which was basically Atari Planetarium that was converted over to Apple and the Commodore when I was working for Microillusions for that purpose. Other games I worked on were things like Chessmaster 2000. David Kittinger, he did all of the heuristics. I did everything else. And now we did on the Atari, the Commodore, the Apple, of course, and it was all supported over to the PC. Now, how did you get involved with the Dreamers Guild? I just had come back from a company called Acosoft International out of uh, Holland or the Netherlands. And when I came back, Robert McNally and I, we were discussing games over a period of something like four years. Uh, and he kept saying that he wanted to put together a company. And I kept saying, well, I want to put together a company too. Let's 
merge our talents together and see if we can come up with something that will be uh, a lot of fun and lucrative. And of course we did. And one of the projects that we ended up working on was of course Inherit the Earth. What were your roles in the development of Inherit the Earth Quest for the Orb? Basically Robert McNally and I, we went to New World Computing to pitch them on the idea of producing this game. And of course they went for it and so he and I conjured up the contracts for it. And at that point, we felt we could put together a really good team, which we did, uh, that would do an extraordinary job, you know, in which they did. We were very happy to basically divide up the task in a very reasonable way. In fact, we discussed, because of my acting background, we had discussed uh, about using the template that they use in the entertainment industry, that is having a director, uh, producer, uh, and so forth, right down the line. I became the producer of Inherit the Earth. Uh, it was my job basically to bring all the materials together, all the people we would need, uh, all of the materials to develop the game. Uh, I also had the privilege of uh, being one of the programmers on it. In fact, uh, most of the interface was created by me and some of the logic and some of the puzzles I also created. I also worked on the sound card support and a variety of other programming that was required for the various different platforms that we worked on at that time. Uh, I had a chance to work with some marvelous people like Talon, uh, that's David Joyner. He was the director and the technical director on the project and it was my job to keep everything going and smoothly as possible in a time frame and make the milestones and get paid for those milestones. And it was his job to basically make sure that the product was a good solid product, something that we could all be proud of. What is your opinion of the finished product? What I really enjoyed about the game, I thought it was a great game when we released it, and we were hoping that we were going to have a sequel that New World would have put out uh, for us to be able to continue with all of the great design ideas that we had, uh, all the additional characters, the additional uh, uh, puzzles, the additional screens. I mean, we just had a whole slew of things that we were very interested in incorporating but we couldn't do it because of the lack of funds and, of course, time. We had milestones to keep, and they had uh, their time frames in which they had to have the product done in order to make Christmas sales. So, of course, we did what we could, and we were hoping that we could do more with it. If I remember correctly, you were involved in some way with the original Hint book. Uh, yes, I wrote most of it, and uh, the artwork was done by Ed Lockbon and April Lee. And I had a wonderful time putting it together because I used a lot of jokes in it to try and lighten it up a little. Uh, Robert Lay also, he edited it to make it more comedic. After Inherit the Earth, what other games did you work on at the Dreamers Guild? I worked on about 13 other games uh, that I was responsible for. And uh, the most notable ones was, of course, Inherit the Earth. Then you had Dinotopia and I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream. Uh, that was put out for Cyber Dreams. It was a Game Developer Conference Spotlight Award winner. Interestingly, after the Dreamers Guild, you went to work for New World Computing. That's right. I worked on a game called Heroes of Might and Magic 2, and that was also another Spotlight Award winner. It was the fifth most played game in the world at that time. What game did you work on after you left New World Computing? After I left New World Computing, I went to Black Ops Entertainment, and I worked on a product called March Madness 2000. Uh, after that, I went into Prolific Publishing in Burbank, and I worked on Shrek Swamp Cart Raceway, and that was the last game I worked on. Then I retired and decided to do other things. At the top of this interview, you did mention you'd moved on to other arenas. Yes, I have. I, I'm now an actor and a director. I've been on a number of uh, movies and TV shows. I've done a number of commercials, uh, and I started getting to directing about uh, well, three years ago or so, and I have a movie out there called Love Carries, which I directed and acted in. Uh, it's won 11 awards so far, and I'm hoping to submit it to even more festivals to win even more awards. Well, once again, thank you for letting me come by today. Thank you. It was a pleasure. On June 5th and 6th, I attended Califur, an anthropomorphic animal, aka furry, fan convention held at the Marriott in Irvine, California. The theme of this year's con was anime, and there were a number of panels on the subject. The guests of honor were artist Shivago D and the multi-talented Adia Albi. Here they are being interviewed at the opening ceremony. One of the panels I attended was on the history of anime. 
The Japanese have incorporated anthropomorphic animals in their art for quite a while, and it's not surprising this has been carried over to anime, even as early as the first decades of the 20th century. Now for a short tour of the con. The lattice room at the convention would have to be the fursuit repair area, which had many large fans running continuously. Yes, those fursuits can overheat their wares. Next up is the fan artist's lounge. On one wall was a large sheet of paper, which artists could use to draw whatever inspired them. Art is a major component of Califer, so not surprisingly most tables in the dealer's room related to art, artists, or costume. My specific highlights of the dealer's room include the wonderful dragon-inspired artwork of Christina Yen. The Squishies table had plushies and little cut-out animals you could buy on cardstock. Here is one that I bought and assembled. Another table provided on-demand custom decals. Instant cosplay. There were a couple of rooms for gaming fans. The one for electronic gaming included a large theater setup. The tabletop gaming room had a number of events, one of which included this guy winning the cons poker tournament. Imagine that. On Saturday, guest of honor Amadea held a concert featuring herself and three other performers. Finally, that brings us to the staple of furry cons, the fursuit parade. One could cast an Inherit the Earth movie from the participants in the parade. That's the end of this report. Thanks for watching.